What is it with classic Doctor Who and trying to extend out a story with key hunts anyways? Oh well, Keys of Marinus, classic Doctor Who review time. It's a first Doctor story, um, and one that is new to me, and it's an odd one. In a way, this very much reminded me of the key to time in microcosm. So if you're not familiar with that one, The Key to Time is a ser is a season of the fourth Doctor, Tom Baker's run, in which there was a theoretical overarching story, but not really. Basically, there were six completely self-contained stories, but at the at the end or at some point during them they were recovering a piece of the key to time that happened to be there during the thing that they were otherwise just could have been a completely standalone adventure so it, it wasn't even really trying to keep up the pretense of being properly serialized the way even trial of the time lord was but um this is a little bit like that except where in um, The Key to Time, each stop-off is a full multi-part, you know, classic Doctor Who story. Here, uh, they have to find the various keys for this machine, the, you know, the keys of Marinus, and um, each stop-off and segment and key is a single 25-minute episode. So, that's what I, what's, what I meant by in microcosm. It's, uh, well, it's, it's an interesting way to sort of deal with the situation they had, which was the main thing was William Hartnell wanted some time off. And part of how they did that is partway through the story, they, they split the party. The doctor goes off to do his own thing and deal with something, and then the companions kind of get into their own shenanigans that the doctor's later going to show up and help bail them out of. And it actually structurally works pretty well. So, um, and it... It feels more organic to the story and less um, crowbarred in uh, than something like, say, oh no, the Doctor's been knocked out and won't be appearing in this episode. He's just over there, under a blanket. Which is the kind of thing that would happen at some later points in, uh, in uh, Hartnell's run. But um, the overall... So, boy, this is a hard thing to talk about because... On the one hand, there isn't that much of an overarching story to talk about, but on the other hand, because each individual story is wrapped up in 25 minutes, there isn't a lot to talk about with those either. So somehow I watched a six-part classic era Doctor Who story and feel like I don't have a lot to say about it. It's a very weird feeling. Um, there are some adorable miniatures in this. I say adorable and that sounds a little condescending. I don't necessarily mean it to be, but like... It's super obvious that these are miniatures, but you still kind of appreciate and be like, oh, somebody put a lot of work into that. There's also some uh, backdrops and some, uh, I can't even call them map paintings. Yeah, just just unconvincing backdrops that it's like, oh, that, that, that's not quite managing the, oh, how adorable thing. That's just more like, oh, well, that doesn't work. Um, so... We are, we, there's a couple of interesting things done with the companions that I noticed. Um, this, this was during the first season, and this does really feel like the time at which um, Susan's role is really being solidified into that of Screaming Damsel. Like, she literally just gets kidnapped at one point to, to force the plot along and reveal some villains. It's... And she does a lot of screaming. And she's a good screamer. I'll give her that. But yeah, yeah, you can see that the the more intriguing aspects of her character that were in you know her the very first episode of the show, they are being dropped rapidly. And she's just turning into the screaming victim who needs to be rescued. And like it's it's early on too. There's like this thing where they end up on this island and like it's surrounded by like an ocean of acid. And, of course, the one who almost goes into it is, uh, is Susan. And not only that, but, like, a shoe gets knocked in and it dissolves. And they're like, oh. And her, but her reaction is, ah! You know, a big scream and, like, clearly being very distraught. Like, and, and I get it. You, you, you know, it's unnerving to realize you almost did something that was going to get you killed. But at the same time, it's like, is this all she's going to be? And it's, it's starting to feel like, yeah, it is. And it's a, it's a lot of... There's a lot of untapped potential in Susan as a character, unfortunately. Barbara, on the other hand, Barbara... Barbara doesn't mess around. Like, she picks up a blunt weapon and starts swinging. 
at one point. So, like, I'm not going to chalk it up to just they don't know what to do with the female characters because, while Ian ultimately is the more action-oriented of the companions, Barbara is no slouch. She, like, she is proactive, including physically proactive in this story. So, I don't think the problems with Susan are strictly just, like, misogynistic, sexist attitudes being like, oh, it's a girl, what else is she gonna do? No, they clearly know other stuff they can do. They just don't do it with her. But uh, there's another thing that's interesting early on is it's leaning a lot more on, um, at, at this early point, with Ian and Barbara's sort of standing as teachers, which is, uh, you know, and part of that is, like, to keep up the pretense that this was educational. It was trying to be a little bit, but... Part of one of the interesting fallouts of that is that they actually figure some stuff out and sort of have a little back and forth talking about basically laying out, oh, and then that's aesthetic. That must mean this, and these are that, and that, that would mean this. And it's the kind of explanation that I'm used to hearing from the Doctor, and Ian and Barbara are just figuring it out on their own. Just back and forth through using the knowledge they have, process of elimination, making maybe one or two reasonable leaps in logic, and they're sorting this stuff out on their own. It's kind of neat to see, especially given in modern era how frequently dependent the companion is on the Doctor to explain literally everything. To see companions just work the situation on their own, it's kind of nice to see. I will say that if I'm going to register an overall complaint about this, because again, there, there, isn't, there isn't really all that much uh, to each individual story to really dig into, for good or ill. So, like, none of them outstay their welcome. It, it does make sense that I don't think any of these individual episode sort of stories would have carried a full serial. So, like, this is a decent place to put them uh, if these were ideas that weren't going to hold. Um, so, you know, there, there is that. I'll give it that. But... There is also, like, I feel a very massive missed opportunity. Because, like, there's something that really felt like it was set up. And it just doesn't do anything with... Which probably means that um, Terry Nation, who was the writer on this, didn't realize the uh, storytelling opportunity he'd laid for himself. So, at the start, the whole... The keys are to repower this device. Now, this device is referred to, I forget exactly uh, what it's called, but in the broad strokes, when active and working, it enforced peace. And this machine served as an impartial judge and jury. And it really felt like the making of a, of a dystopia, of a misguided attempt to force peace or to um, try and clamp down on beings' own natural instincts. Like, obviously, you don't want people just to run wild and just tear everything apart. But when you try to just completely clamp down on that, that's not good either. And the villains are basically presented as people who aren't, weren't being properly controlled by this thing and are now um, trying to take it over. And it, and it needs to be um, sort of, uh, shored up in a way that it will, it will cleanse them of bad thoughts and make them docile too. And like, this is all pretty shady stuff. And initially, you know, the Doctor and the companions, they're like, well, we'll, we'll do what we can to help you. And they are actually admittedly coerced into this because initially they're just going to leave. They're like, boy, sure does suck. Your machine's not working anymore. Well, we're going to leave now. But they try and get in the TARDIS and they can't because it's encased in a force field that uh, the guy says he won't lift until they come back with the key pieces. I was waiting for them to come back and ideally realize before they got there that actually this machine's kind of messed up. Like, the people that are coming and trying to take it over or wreck the thing, like, they're still bad or every and everything, but, like, what you're doing, dude, it's not actually a good thing. Show never does come around to that, though. It just doesn't really deal with the situation it describes in terms of this machine that just enforces peace, whatever that means. It just felt like a setup for something to really examine, um, you know, misguided good intent. And it, then it just doesn't, which is very odd. 
a fair amount of time is taken up with, uh, and like, it's especially odd given that a fair amount of time for this is taken up with this um, trial uh, of Ian in this basically upside down uh, justice system where the full burden of proof is on the defense. Um, the prosecution doesn't have to prove a damn thing. The defense must prove uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that they didn't do a crime, which is obviously, especially to our perceptions, pretty messed up. And that really feels like that would lead very naturally into sort of about realizing that this machine is bad. And like, to be fair, the machine doesn't get turned back on at the end. The machine gets destroyed. But it didn't feel like it was done because it was a bad thing that shouldn't exist. It was like, well, that's how we'll defeat the bad guys. We'll, we'll slip them this thing that'll make the whole thing stop working and blow up. And it's, it's weird. It's a weird missed opportunity. And really, it felt very deliberately set up. And it, it just wasn't. Uh, Hartnell is pretty solid uh, in this. He, ha he has um, some very specific moments like where he figures out something. And he like figures out who's behind something. Like absolute joy and glee. And it feels like one of the earlier moments where he's like really gets that giddiness to him that is... Like, we, we remember the first Doctor as being grumpy, but, like, he had that joy. And we get to see that here. It's fairly brief, but, like, it's wonderful to see. I love seeing it from him when he did it. And I think the fact that he didn't overdo it probably makes it feel a little bit more special. So, like, that's no bad thing. And, um... I... I'm just realizing I've been recording this whole thing <coughs> and the mic was over there, which means I don't know if I'll be able to use the sound I've been recording. I might have to take it off the, uh, off the on deck mic that's, that's on the camera, which means the sound won't be as good. Uh, it's been a bit of a day. I'll just... I'll just say that. Uh, did I have anything else? Um, yeah, oh yeah, the other thing was like, at a few points it feels rushed, like especially after the uh, sort of the trial stuff and there's like a conspiracy uncovered and it's like, the whole thing is wrapped up with we uncover who it is and then um, they notify the authorities and then we're just like, and yes, she's been taken away and she'll be dealt with. And I'm like, oh, we're just... We're just, we're not going to show any of that. Okay. And I think that's, that's where, you know, while I said these stories didn't, wouldn't necessarily hold for full serials, that's where cramming them into just 25 minutes kind of bites it in the butt a little bit. It does get rushed at a few points. But overall, it's, it's interesting to see this early point Doctor Who with them kind of, kind of testing the, uh, the limits and the uh, utility of the format. And sort of seeing, well, does it work if we do it this, which is a little different? Does it work if we do this, which is a little different? And it's it's an interesting thing to see these early episodes before the show had fully settled into what was the standard template for classic era Doctor Who. It still feels uh, a little bit experimental at this point, which is no bad thing. I'm not sure it's one I'd ever particularly want to come back or revisit, but no, yeah, it's decent. It's a little wonky, it's a little wobbly, but in a way that's like, oh, you're still figuring stuff out. Got it. So it, there's an endearing quality to it. A bit like those uh, adorable miniatures I said at the beginning. They're not convincing, but they're kind of cute. And you're like, yeah, yeah, keep working it. You've got something here. That kind of feels like he's a Marinus overall. Have you rewatched this one or watched it at all or whatever seen it thing? You know it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon pays the bills and uh, is how this episode was voted on um, because I uh, gave the options for what first Doctor story to uh, go into to the patrons. This was what the vote turned out to be. You want to vote in polls? See my docket early? Anything like that? That's the place to get it. Get access to it. Even if you can't help me out um, by supporting me on Patreon, like, share, subscribe, also help. Don't worry too much about it, though. We take a relaxed attitude around here so you can come on back next time you need a break. Massive thanks to my Patreon supporters, and in particular, I want to thank Robin Moore, Zubin Lutfulla, 
Turok, the thing that goes doink in the anime, Ruth, Oliver B, Solitary Pictures, Ulrich Bogdan, Melinda Walters, Jen, The Oath of Boyd, Auntie Kate 808, Becky Sparks, Pranabi Likes the Poodle, Robin Powell, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casperl, Adam R.D.L. Taylor, David Hall, Shayla Gourlay, and Rosalind Bennett. Thanks for your support. You can get your name in the credits too if you feel like hearing me possibly struggle with it for several times before getting it right. 